Okay. So, um, frameworks for developing the intervention. I apologise, that slide was in the wrong place for some reason. Um, frameworks for intervention development. There's been a huge amount of work, um, I think, in the 21st century on intervention development. So, I just did a little search on um, PubMed and, you can s and had a look at the number of publications with intervention development in the title. And you can see there's nothing, really. If you go back to 1980, 1990, there's not very much. 2000 is a little bit, and then this huge kind of spike. There's a huge number of, of people interested in how you develop interventions, particularly non-drug interventions. I mean, the process for developing drug interventions has been around for years and years and is well established, but how do you develop good interventions that are not drug interventions? And I think one of the best um, uh, sources of, of sort of guidance on that is the UK MRC's framework um, on complex interventions. But there are other things um, that uh, have uh, come into um, their own more recently, and one is the Precy 2 tool, which can help people to think through how pragmatic their trial is or their intervention is when they are developing it. Um, and then there's a framework that we developed recently for thinking about pilot feasibility studies, and many of these pragmatic trials need pilot feasibility studies. So that's um, quite a good framework to look at for thinking, what do I need to do in terms of piloting and feasibility? There are other much more specific papers, for example, and I've only given one example here, the ADEPT framework, and that's looking at how you make decisions. Once you've done some feasibility work, how do you then make decisions about whether to go ahead with the main trial. Can you explain a bit what you consider a pilot study? Uh, <laughs> whether that continues into the main trial? Or okay. So, okay, yeah. So that's, so that's probably, that's another, that's another talk because we've done all this work on pilot and feasibility studies. So I think we did, a, we, did, we did a big piece of work in the UK over the past five years on this. Um, and we started by taking the National Institute for Health Research definitions of pilot feasibility studies. We didn't end up there. So now our view is very simple. It's a, so in a nutshell, um, if you are piloting something, then that's a pilot study. If you're assessing feasibility, then that's a feasibility study. And if you put those two together, what that means that pilot studies that are usually assessing feasibility are all feasibility studies. So you have this big basket of feasibility studies, and within it you have smaller pilot studies. Now, in the UK, there's been a, um, a, a move uh, sort of precipitated, I think, by the National Institute of Health Research um, policy, a move to, as much as possible, put pilot work into um, all pragmatic trials in terms of an internal pilot. So a bit of piloting within the trial itself. So the first few sites, the first 100 people, the first, some, some small beginning part of a pragmatic trial will normally be an internal pilot. And these patients are kept in the analysis. And they're kept in the analysis, yes. And that is a National Institute for Health Research policy really now. Um, when you sit on, on boards like this at, at NIHR, the trial is not likely to get through the board unless it has an internal pilot. So that's a very, very strong policy. But there's also an expectation that people will have done some feasibility work beforehand, and that may include an external pilot. Again, I think we've developed this framework about what these things are, but I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done on um, pilot and feasibility um, and how much you actually need. Because that one of the problems with pilot feasibility work is you can go on for years and years and years doing feasibility and pilot work, and then it delays the, uh, getting the answer to the question that you really want. And by the time you've got there, your health service organization might have totally changed and, and the question that you're asking might actually be irrelevant. So I think there is um, an issue about trying to decide exactly what you need to do in terms of feasibility and pilot studies. And that piece of work also still has to be done. Did that answer the question? Okay, so ethics and regulation. So one of the things um, everybody wants from a trial is for it to be ethically sound, but actually um, everybody wants it to be scientifically sound as well. Now, um, in, in, in my experience, those two things don't always go together. Sometimes they actually conflict. So um, just to take an example, informed consent. So ethically, from an ethical point of view, everybody would agree we need informed consent in trials. 
um, we can't proceed with the trial without having informed consent. That's the general view. But if you think about um, a pragmatic trial, will your informed consent processes be so burdensome on participants that they won't want to take part in the consent process? Or when you inform them of what's actually in the trial, they won't want to take part in the trial for some reason. So that will those informed consent processes themselves mean that, that the people you end up with in the trial are not representative of the population um, that you actually want them to be representative of? So that's one of the issues with, with pragmatic trials. Do our com informed consent processes actually affect the nature of the pragmatic trial and move it a little bit away from that pragmatic end of the spectrum? The other thing, and I'll talk specifically about this in terms of cluster randomised trials in a moment, is will the informed consent process conflict with the science? Will it cause bias? And there are situations in which informed consent processes can cause bias in trials. And what should you do um, when that happens? So um, there, are, there are various uh, things that people have suggested um, and there are different models of consent. I think anybody know about the Get Real initiative, the in, uh, um, Innovative Medicines Initiative, the Get Real program. I think they've, um, they've done some work on dif different models of consent. It's really, it's really around, um, mostly around drug trials. I'm not sure how easily it transfers into non-drug trials. But where the idea is to make the consent less burdensome. So you do it in a slightly different way, at a slightly different time with your participants to make it less burdensome. The other thing you can, of course, go for is a waiver of consent. So um, that is now accepted um, within the UK um, for some types of research. We can get waivers of consent. I'm not sure if that's the same in Belgium. Can you get waiv waivers of, will ethics committees give you waivers of consent? Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, and I, and I think again, I mean, this is, this is an issue where it's not clear and also it's not consistent across countries, but I suspect in the UK it's also not consistent across different ethics committees. Um, but if you are faced with this issue that either you do a trial where somehow your informed consent process is going to compromise the science or you don't do informed consent, in which case some people would say that compromises the ethics. So how do you deal with that tension? So um, in the UK, um, we have these lovely bodies with some sort of oversight over um, trial conduct. So the MHRA, Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority, is our competent authority for dealing with um, clinical trials of investigational medicinal products. Um, and if you read what MHRA say about clinical research here, what they say is good clinical practice is a set of internationally recognised ethical and scientific quality requirements that must be followed when designing, conducting, record, um, recording and reporting clinical trials that involve people. So, uh, I mean, that, that sounds good. I mean, they, you know, they, they want to, to look after the patients in trials. Um, the UK Health Research Authority is a sort of overarching body, and under that comes th things like uh, our uh, research governance and um, research ethics committees. Um, and and UK, uh, the UK Health Research Authority say again, we want to protect and promote the interests of the patients. Um, we want to make the UK a great place to do research. That's what they say, and that sounds great. Um, however, with pragmatic trials, you can often come up against um, issues when you're dealing with these sorts of bodies because actually what the, 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 their ideas come out of um, drug trials and drug trial development and clinical trials, investigational medicinal products, which many pragmatic trials are not. So just to give you a few um, examples of that, and these, these are real examples. So from the UK... Um, we have uh, an example of a trial done in UK general practice. So this trial was done in UK general practices. It was of a, quite a rare condition. So many, many general practices were involved. General, practices, um, general practitioners within general practices would possibly recruit one, two, maybe no patients. So very, very small numbers. 
Um, but they were required, all of those general practitioners, all of the potential staff who might recruit anybody were required to do um, good clinical practice training. Um, that's quite a heavy burden on people whose input into the trial is going to be very, very small. Adverse events, this comes from a, a, an example from the United States of a trial done in um, residential homes for older people. So it's done in a high risk setting in terms of adverse events already. Um, in in uh, residential care for older people, there are lots of adverse events. People fall over, um, they, they um, take medication, they shouldn't take, all sorts of things happen. So um, in this particular trial though, the investigators were required, the, the intervention itself was very low risk, but it was a high risk population. But the investigators were required to collect data on every single adverse event um, for participants in that trial. That meant that they had to uh, recruit another researcher just to collect adverse event data for a very low risk um, intervention. Consent I've already gone through um, to some extent, um, but adherence is another um, issue where there can be misunderstandings between um, bodies like these with very good intentions and actually the science of the, the trial. So we, we had um, a trial recently, or in fact the, the trial manager came to me with an issue in a pragmatic trial because she said, but uh, we've, got a, we've got a major issue because we've got five participants who have not adhered to their medication. And actually I said, actually you're doing a pragmatic trial. So we have to decide, well, at that point I said, to her, well, we really have to decide whether you're doing a pragmatic trial um, or not, because if you're doing a pragmatic trial, actually we treat adherence in a different way. This is not a major issue for a regulatory body that we don't have adherence. It's something that we have to take account of in the trial, but it's not the same as if we were doing an explanatory trial. So um, my take on this is that we live in a highly regulated, risk-averse society. It's not, true, it's not only true in health research, it's true um, everywhere. Um, um, I don't know if, it quite, if it's quite the same in Belgium as it is in the UK, but it feels that in the UK um, you can't take any risks at all. You know, in schools, schools aren't allowed to take any risks with children, and um, everywhere you go, you can't take risks. Um, and I think because of that, this idea has built up that we have to um, do everything we can to protect everybody from risk. In fact, a lot of pragmatic trials are very, very low risk. And I think we should maybe be rethinking some of this. Um, and some of it needs scientists and ethicists, regulators, round the table talking to each other about some of these issues. Yes. Maybe it's out of context, but usually when we talk about trials, we tend to think of uh, the medical risk. And uh, there is also a lot of other potential harm, psychological yeah. harm, uh, yeah. so social harm, yeah. which is usually not taken to, into account. So in that sense, I, I tend to, to, to be a little bit cautious with the, the, the statement they are low risk because they are usually yeah. medically low risk. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. And I, so I think this is an area where we have, to, we have to think about it in a different way because you're absolutely right. Those other risks can be there in some of these trials. Um, nevertheless, I would still say that for most of the trials we do within the Pragmatic Clinical Trials Unit, they are low risk. We're educating um, GPs to help them um, treat their patients better. Or um, we're doing some kind of a, a group therapy, which is, you know, painting in the afternoon or something like that. It's, they're not high-risk trials, a lot of them. Um, but I think it's important that for, for each trial, we think about the risks and whether they are high-risk or whether they are low-risk. Um, if they are low-risk, then I think we need to think through a little bit more about what we're doing in this very risk-averse risk society. But I think one of the key things is that people need to talk to each other. Scientists, ethicists... Um, need to get round the table and talk to each other um, about this. Okay, so um, this, is a, this is a bit of good news then on that. So um, 
this is a recently funded piece of work that it looks like it's going to go on for a very long time um, that I'm involved in, but there are a number of ethicists and scientists involved in this work looking at developing a framework for the ethical design of, and conduct of pragmatic trials. So I hope it's not going to take um, as long as 2021 to get some results out of this research, but it's over the next four years we're going to look at that, try and see if we can do a piece of work on that. So, um, bias. Um, bias is uh, uh, also, I think, an issue which is thought about um, in terms of explanatory trials in a particular way, and that doesn't always transfer into pragmatic trials. So bias, um, this is a, an online definition of bias. Any tendency which prevents an unprejudiced consideration of a question. So one of the key things there is to think what is the question that we're trying to answer and where could bias arise? How could we get the wrong answer to this question that we're asking? So um, there's a couple of, of questions from Wait. Does parent initiated Monte Lucas prevent attendances for wees in preschool children? So there we want to, we want to um, make sure that there's no differences between our two groups in anything else except for the parent initiated um, Monte Lucas. And we want to be able to measure the attendances for WEEZ accurately and make sure that we're measuring the same, them the same way in the control and intervention group. So it's worth unpacking questions to, to sort out what is it that we actually want to look at here and, and make sure we understand exactly what the question is. In terms of the intervention, this is very important because, as I said earlier, sometimes the intervention is not the therapy, but it's the offer of the therapy. So we've got to be really clear about what our in intervention is to know um, what, uh, what we're asking. So, I mean, we can look at the, the, the PCOS um, uh, elements, population intervention, comparison, outcome and setting and look at all of those and make sure we know exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about those five things so that we can see wh where the biases are. If we really want to be doing this trial in this particular setting, have we got some settings which really don't fit in there? If we really want to be doing this trial among this particular population, are we recruiting so that we've got a representative sample, etc.? Where are the biases going to occur? And the basic principle of bias is that bias occurs when individuals respond to information. So this is not just true in um, healthcare, but it's true in other um, areas as well. For example, if you're um, recruiting to a job, then if you have information, some information on gender, ethnicity, etc., um, there is the potential to be biased in your response to whether you want to shortlist people or not. That's a, another example. Um, so in an explanatory trial, the, the standard um, way of dealing with bias is through placebos. So through, if, we, if we use a placebo, then nobody, not the patient, not the person delivering the treatment, um, not the outcome assessor, nobody knows who's got the intervention um, and who's got the control um, treatment. So that information is kept from people, um, and in that way, we deal with a lot of the bias. We can't do that often in pragmatic trials because pragmatic trials are very often not, um, it's not possible to blind them. If you're having a certain type of surgery or you're having something that's not surgery, it's not possible to blind you as to whether you have the surgery or not. If you're receiving some kind of education, it's not possible to blind you as to whether you're receiving education or not. So often in a pragmatic trial, um, there is no blinding of those delivering the intervention and there is no blinding of the patients. It means some people have information and the key thing in a pragmatic trial is to think who has information about what and could this cause bias. So for drug trials, for example, as I've just said, we use a placebo so that those giving out the drug and those taking it can't distinguish um, we make sure that those collecting outcome data don't know whether individuals were in the intervention or control groups. We make sure that those recruiting participants don't know whether an individual that's sitting in front of them is likely to get the intervention and control or control um, treatment when they're recruited, and that's usually done by allocation concealment. And then um, we can be careful about who, who has access to what sort of data. Now, in a pragmatic non-drug trial, we can't, as I've said, use a placebo. We can try and make sure those collecting outcome data 
don't know whether people were in the intervention or control group, but that's often difficult. Um, we can make sure that those recruiting um, can't decide which group individuals go into, the intervention or control throughout, through allocation concealment. That's usually possible, and we can be careful about who has access to what data. So the lack of placebo and, and access to data. So uh, one of the things about pragmatic trials is that if somebody knows whether they're getting the intervention, um, then, then if they know what they're getting, that in itself is not a source of bias because that is what would happen in the real world. The source of bias is the knowledge that there's some other group getting something different. Well, I think that's quite an important distinction. Um, access to data, I think, is an interesting issue. Um, and, and one of the key issues there that we come across quite a lot is the chief investigator of a trial as a prime source of bias if you allow them to have certain information. So if the chief investigator has access to data on interim trial results, for example, and the interim trial results um, show that the trial is not going very well, that the intervention doesn't look very effective, then it's possible for the chief investigator, who's usually in quite an influential position, they could potentially try and do something about that by fiddling with the intervention, by altering it slightly. That's not a good thing, because then your intervention towards the end of the trial will look different from the intervention at the beginning. It's, it's not clear, then, to decision-makers exactly what you were evaluating. <coughs> 